OK, let's compare answers. Question one, why does the play begin with the weird sisters? So some of you at first said that it is in order to give us the prophecy so that we know what to expect in the play. The problem is the prophecy only comes later. The opening scene does not give us any really important information. Let's take a look. OK, so thunder and lightning. We have special effects. And it says lightning, right? So there's also lighting effects. From this, we know that the play was performed indoors, not in the open air theater, but in like a closed theater for like nobles. Enter three witches. First witch, when shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? Second witch, when the hurly burly's done. Hurly burly just means evil things. When the battle's lost and won. So here we have the first instance of paradox saying something confusing. When the battle's lost and won. You can lose a battle and win the battle at the same time. Third witch, that will be ere the set of sun. So it will be before the sun sets. So I guess this is telling us uh, we will get to the confusing battle before the play ends. Where the place upon the heath? A heath is just empty ground. There to meet with Macbeth. So this is the only information that we really get from this scene, that they're going to come again to meet with Macbeth. I come, Grimalkin, Paddock calls. These two are both devils. Third witch, Anon. Anon means soon. Fair is foul and foul is fair. So this is another paradox. What is beautiful is ugly. What is ugly is beautiful. Hover through the fog and filthy air. This is how they're supposed to travel. Witches are supposed to be able to fly. They hover through the fog and filthy air. And that's it. That's the first scene. So we don't get a lot of information. So why do we have this scene in the very first place? So some groups ultimately came up with the answer that these witches are very important to the play. Without their later prophecy, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth would not do anything evil. And so the entire play is influenced by this supernatural idea of prophecy and fate, like a demon is telling them to kill the king. If the whole play is that kind of supernatural and spooky, uh, then it makes sense to tell the audience right away that this play is not entirely realistic. There will be supernatural and spooky elements, and you should remember that when you're watching the realistic parts. So later on, we have like a ghost, we have a prophecy, uh, weird stuff like that. And that only makes sense if from the very beginning, we understand that this play will not be entirely realistic. Now, there's another reason, which is a more historical reason. I mentioned two weeks ago that um, this play was performed for King James the first. And King James the first was very superstitious. He even wrote a book about demons called the demonology. So he really believed in this kind of stuff. So writing a play about witches and demons and ghosts may have also been to cater to the new king's taste. Shakespeare might have wanted to give the king a play that he would enjoy. And so it'd be very important to give all of that information, all of that uh, 
genre information about the play at the very beginning. Immediately let the king be interested in this play. Also, uh, the name of the witches is the Weird Sisters. Does that name look familiar to you? Have you seen this name somewhere else? Have you read Harry Potter? In Harry Potter, the Weird Sisters is the name of the rock band whose music they hear on the radio. OK, number two. Uh, one group took this question and they agree that it makes sense. Sometimes in order to hurt us, some people will give us accurate information. Uh, sometimes that information will, will be. It looks like it's accurate, but it's not true, but also sometimes it will be true, but it will not be complete. Just like in this play, the witches give Macbeth accurate information. He does become Thane of Cawdor, he does become king. And he does uh, lose his power when certain things happen. But they don't tell Macbeth the cost of his new power. They don't tell Macbeth how those seemingly impossible things will come to pass that take away his power. So they so they only give him partial information. Uh, and this, I think, is an important idea to remember. Somebody who tells you the truth could still be trying to hurt you. Think about uh, fraudsters and schemesters, right? people who want your money. They may not all be lying. Sometimes they may tell the truth, but it won't be the whole truth. Or think about international events. Right, the world is currently going through multiple wars. How much of what the governments and fighters say can we believe? They may lie, but they also might tell you only part of the truth. Just because what they say is real and true does not mean that we should believe everything they say. So like today, this idea is especially important to remember. OK, number three, this is also a popular question. Why does Lady Macbeth call in spirits to unsex her now? Let's look at this. Page one, two, six, five. Line 40, so this is right after Lady Macbeth receives a letter from her husband. And her husband tells her, oh, I met these weird sisters. They told me I would become king. And so like here, Mac Lady Macbeth suddenly feels very ambitious. And so here, line 40. Come, you spirits that that tend on mortal thoughts. So tend here means attend or serve. So the spirits that help you achieve what you are thinking of. Come, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe, which means from the head to the toe. Top full of direst cruelty, fill me with cruelty. Make thick my blood. Uh, so this means give me courage. Usually, um, People say that um, if you look pale and you're about to faint, it's because your blood is too thin. They used to say that. So make thick my blood is like, make sure I have the courage and the energy. Stop up the excess and passage to remorse. So prevent me from feeling remorse. That no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose. Compunctious means guilty. So don't let natural guilt shake my terrible, fell means terrible purpose, my terrible goal. So don't make me feel guilty. 
uh, enough to stop me from doing this. Nor keep peace between the fact and it. And also, uh, like, don't, uh, like, what is this? 46, 47. Ah, right. And so here she's talking about the relationship between the purpose and the effect. So don't make me feel too guilty to want to stop and help me make sure that the goal is actually achieved, that I do what I want to do. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall. So take my woman's milk and turn it into gall. Gall is a body fluid that is related to courage. So take my womanly body fluid and turn it into a, a body fluid of courage. You murdering ministers. A minister is somebody who helps. So spirits are helping her to commit murder. Wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief sightless here means invisible so wherever you are you invisible spirits wherever you to wait on also means to serve to wait on nature's mischief to serve the disturbance of nature come thick night and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, hold, hold, hold means stop. So come night, don't let me and my knife see what we're doing. Don't let heaven see what we're doing. So back to the question, why does she say unsex me? Let's take a short break and we'll answer the question when we come back.
So why does Lady Macbeth call on these evil spirits to unsex her? If we look at this soliloquy, this is one of the famous soliloquies in Macbeth. There are, there are like three famous soliloquies in this play. Here she's asking for the courage and lack of guilt to achieve her purpose, which is to kill the king. And she's also asking for night to prevent her and the heavens from facing what she's actually doing. Are these feminine characteristics? Are these what we would expect of women? So uh, the few groups I talked with all agreed that these are not very feminine characteristics. And so perhaps here she's saying, unsex me, take away my sex. Don't let the fact that I am a woman prevent me from doing this. So especially in the line, um, where is it? Take my milk for gall, take my feminine woman's body fluid and turn it into courage. So if we think of a woman's milk as feeding a baby, caretaking, nurturing, healing, supporting, here she wants the opposite. She wants to take charge, to kill somebody, and to be take an active and leading role in this plan. She wants to be active, not just a supporter. So here, by using the, the term unsex, she's reversing the expectations of women uh, in a traditional culture. This is also one of the more prominent examples throughout the play of nature being distorted. She's a woman, but she's asking, don't let me continue to be a woman. Nature is being distorted. And this is connected with the idea of killing the king. Right, because the king is supposed to be decided by bloodline. Whoever is the king's son or the king's closest relative becomes the next king. But here Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are planning to become rulers by killing the king. It's very unnatural. And so throughout the play, we have examples of nature being distorted, animals going crazy, people going crazy. Uh, and so this is the first example of this phenomenon in the play. Number four. How do you think our knowledge of Macbeth's plans changes our experience of the dialogues between the king and Macbeth and the king and Lady Macbeth? So let's take a look at this. 1, 4, 14 and 1, 6, 10. Okay. 1, 4, 14 and 1, 4, 14. Where's, where's 14? There we go. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so Duncan, uh, where are we? Okay, yeah, so Duncan is, is out in the field. Macbeth comes to visit him. Duncan calls him, oh, worthiest cousin. Cousin just means relative, they, their family, because it's a feudal system, right? So they're all related. Uh, and then he apologizes for not seeing how valuable you are. And then Macbeth says, the service and the loyalty I owe in doing it pays itself. So I, I should serve you. This is only natural. Your Highness's part is to receive our duties. And our duties are to your throne and state children and servants, which do but what they should by doing everything safe toward your love and honor. So we owe our duty to you as king, and we are like your children, and everything we do for you is for your love and for your honor. So it's very polite. And then if we go down to 1, 6, 10 and look at Lady Macbeth, 
Here she's welcoming Duncan into their home. Duncan again begins very politely. See, see our honored hostess. Uh, and we thank you for hosting us, etc. And then Lady Macbeth says, all our service in every point twice done and then done double. We're poor and single business to contend against those honors deep and broad wherewith your majesty loads our house. So everything that we have done for you, even if we do it again, again and again, is still unable to be compared with the honor that you, the king, gives us by staying at our house. So Lady Macbeth is also being very polite. But at this moment, we know that the Macbeth couple are planning to kill him. So in fact, the more polite that they are here, the more the stronger emotion we feel as the reader and as the audience. And the group that took this question pointed out in their answer the idea of dramatic irony. In Chinese, I guess we would call this xi zhu xing feng ci, but it's not a very good translation. Irony in literature means that what is on the surface is different from what is actually the case. So it looks one way, but it is actually another way. So here it looks like Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are being very polite to the king and that they love him and support him. When in fact they're planning to kill him. And it's dramatic irony. Dramatic irony is a kind of irony that means we know more than the characters. So in this case, we know more than Duncan. Duncan still thinks that these two people are his loyal servants, his loyal supporters. But we have seen Macbeth and Lady Macbeth come up with the plan to kill him. So we know that what Duncan thinks is not true. And that creates tension, Zhangli. And tension makes things interesting and exciting. So the more polite the Macbeths are in this scene, the more strongly we feel that tension and we're expecting something terrible to happen later. This is one way that uh, Shakespeare makes this play so interesting. In fact, the whole situation of the play is also a kind of irony, but it's not dramatic irony uh, because we, the audience, if we see or read this play for the first time, we don't know exactly how it will end. So it's not dramatic irony. We don't know more than the characters. It's actually something called cosmic irony. The gods, or in this case, the devil, the witches, know more than Macbeth. Uh, and we know that they're evil and they cannot be trusted. So we feel the difference between what they say and what they're actually doing to Macbeth. Even if we don't know the details, we know that there is a gap, there's a difference. And so the whole play is powered by cosmic irony. The whole reason people enjoy this play is because they know that it's not going to end well. They just want to see how it will end poorly for Macbeth. So irony is like the central idea or the central um, aspect of this play. Finally, question five. Nobody took this question, so it's my question. Uh, Macbeth's objections to assassinating Duncan seem to make sense. How does Lady Macbeth convince him otherwise? So let's take a look at this. Act one, scene seven. OK. If it were done, uh, if it were done when tis done, then twere well it, it were done quickly. So if I really do this, I need to do it fast. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success, 
So if we could kill him and nothing bad would happen, and with his death we would immediately succeed, that but this blow might be the be all and the end all. So if I could simply kill him with one blow and that would be the end of it. This is what he hopes for, what he dreams of. Uh, this phrase, the be all and end all, is sometimes we still use this in modern English. So it would be the end of everything. Here, but here, upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. So if it could be like that, we kill him and it's done, then we would essentially escape hell. Right, we'd jump the life to come. We'd escape the next life, which would be hell. Uh, upon this bank and shoal of time. So it's comparing time to uh, the sea. Uh, it, like the, the traditional idea is that time is a vast sea. And just like we can't see to the other side, we also cannot see what will happen in the future. So you're standing on the edge of time. You're standing on the bank of the sea. And yet we would be able to skip the, the consequence of going to hell. But in these cases, we still have judgment here that we but teach bloody instructions which being taught return to plague the inventor. So in reality, Macbeth knows, when you kill somebody, important, other people will try to kill you, right? So we but teach bloody instructions. What we're doing will actually lead to more bloodshed. Which being taught return, plague means pose a danger to, will endanger the person who taught it. So by killing Duncan, we also bring danger to ourselves. This even handed justice commends the ingredients of our poison chalice to our own lips. A chalice is a cup. So it's saying like because of this kind of justice, when we try to poison somebody else, we're actually poisoning ourselves. He's here in double trust. So the king is in my house and there are two reasons why he should be able to trust me. First is I am his kinsman and his subject. So I am a, a loyal follower. Strong both against the deed. So I am a family member. I am a follower. I should not kill him. Then as his host who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. OK, in traditional Western culture. It is very, very important for the host to protect the guest. This goes back all the way to ancient Greece. In ancient Greece, if you remember from the Odyssey, right? Do all the side as whole. When somebody you don't know comes to your front door. So like when a stranger comes to your door and asks you for like food or for help or something, the first thing you do is you let them take a bath and you give them something to eat and drink. And only after that, are you supposed to ask the stranger about the details? What kind of help do you need? Who are you? And that's why Odysseus could get away with like cheating so many people because they're not supposed to ask him, who are you until they have taken care of him? So this tradition survives even today. Uh, and in this play, as it says, as the king's host, I should protect him against murderers. I shouldn't kill him myself. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, he has done his kingly duties in such a kind way, has been so clear in his great office. He has been very direct and open as king, that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off. So he's such a good king that even the angels would try to help him. And pity like a naked newborn babe striding the blast or heaven's cherubim horsed upon the side of the courtiers of the air shall blow the horrid deed in every eye. The tears tell drown the wind. So if I kill him, 
all of nature, all of pity, all of heaven will share the news everywhere because he's such a beloved king. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent. A spur is the thing that you put on your shoe to stick into a horse to make it go faster. Matsu. So he's saying there's nothing on my side that would encourage me to do this except my vaulting ambition. Which or leaps itself and falls on the other. So my ambition is so great that it leaps over itself. So like it's such great ambition that it becomes a problem. So this speech seems very reasonable. He's saying all of the reasons I shouldn't kill him and the only reason I want to kill him is because of my ambition and this ambition is so great that it's actually hurting me. Makes sense, but then how does Lady Macbeth change his mind? Line 32, he tells her we will proceed no further in this business, so we're going to stop. And Lady Macbeth says, was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since? So at the beginning, when you wrote that letter to me and you were filled with hope, were you in fact drunk? Did you were you not serious? And has that hope disappeared? Has it fallen asleep? And wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? So these three lines are comparing Macbeth's original ambition to somebody getting drunk. Like they like they think they can handle this alcohol. They drink a lot, they fall asleep, and the next day they have a hangover. Is that what your ambition has done to you? From this time, such I account thy love. So if this is how you treat your ambition, then this is how I think you treat your love. If this is how you feel about ambition, is this also the same way that you love me, regretfully? Art thou afeard to be the same in thine own act and valor as thou art in desire? So you have the ambition. Are you afraid to be the same person in your actions as you are and in your ambition? Wouldst thou have that which, sorry, wouldst thou have that which thou esteemst the ornament of life and live a coward in thine own esteem? So if you think life is so precious, an ornament, a decoration, would you be willing to keep your life? And yet think of yourself as a coward. In thine own esteem means in your own view, you think of yourself as a coward. Letting I dare not wait upon I would. So every time you say, I would do something immediately. You follow that with, but I dare not. Bukan. Like the poor cat is adage. So apparently there was a famous saying about a cat back then. So Lady Macbeth is basically saying, first of all, how you are so cowardly to change your mind. And then if this is how you treat your emotions, I don't think you really love me. And then even if you keep your life, you will always think of yourself as a coward. So she's actually going at this from many different angles. Right? Trying many different ways to change his mind. And then Macbeth says, pretty peace, which means please be quiet. I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. So if I try to do more than I should, then I can't call myself a man. And Lady Macbeth takes that idea. If you dare to do more than you should, you are not a man. 
and she says, what beast was it? What animal was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? If you're not willing to do it, and yet you told me about it, then were you an animal when you told me about it? When you durst do it, then you were a man. So again, she's she's flipping Macbeth's logic. Macbeth says, uh, you're not a man if you do more than you should. Lady Macbeth says, only when you do what you dare to do are you truly a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. <laughs> so here she's also adding an insult. She's saying only if you do this will you be a man. Therefore, currently you are not a man. Nor time nor place. The first nor means neither. So neither time nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. So uh, even though it's not the right time, it's not the right place, but you should make them the right time and the right place. Like your fate is in your own hands. They have made themselves and that their fitness now does unmake you. And yet here we do have the right time and the right place. The king is in our house. But precisely because it is possible, now you are scared. They have unmade you. I have given suck, so I have fed babies with my milk. And know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out. So I would have thrown the baby on the ground and broken his head. Had I so sworn as you have done to this. So if I swore I would kill my own baby, I would actually do it. But you have sworn to kill the king. And you're not willing to do it. So this is her next strategy, trying to shame him by saying, if you don't kill the king, you're not a man. This is also very interesting because Lady Macbeth, as we just saw earlier, prayed that she would not be a woman. And Macbeth, if we should fail, in fact, when he says this, he's already starting to change his mind, right? He's starting to think, maybe we can do it, but what if we fail? Lady Macbeth, we fail? How can you even think about failing? But screw your courage to the sticking place and we'll not fail. This is also a very famous line from this play. Sometimes you'll see this in modern English. Screw your courage to the sticking place. So this is using the metaphor of like a, a screw, right? Uh, Make sure your courage doesn't fall out. Screw it in tightly. And will not fail. Uh, and then after like uh, outlining the plan, Macbeth agrees. Bring forth men children only. So right at, before Lady Macbeth is saying you're not a man, and here he when he agrees, he's saying my children will only be men. I am so manly that all of my children will also only be men. But also because Lady Macbeth here behaves like a man. For thy undaunted metal, your un, uh, unobscured courage should compose nothing but males. You are also such a man that our children will only be men. So like, how does Lady Macbeth change his mind? She insults him. She uses comparison with herself. She calls him not a man. Like she uses logic and emotion and her personal connection with, with Macbeth. She works all the angles. She tries everything. So why does it work? 
Because as Macbeth said, one small part of him actually does want to kill the king. He does have that ambition. So if Lady Macbeth tries everything, then surely at least one thing will work to change his mind. And it's probably the part where she says you're not a man if you don't kill him. Uh, as we discussed for question three, the idea of being a man is related to ambition and power. Only a man can become king. So by calling him not a man, she's also saying you don't deserve to be king. And that prods his ambition. He wants to be king. Therefore, he must be a man. Therefore, he will kill Duncan. OK, so those are the five discussion questions. Do you want to ask anything? OK, for next week, please finish up to the end of Act 3. Macbeth is, I think, Shakespeare's shortest play. So hopefully it will be uh, easier for you to finish the assigned reading. And also the movie, um, it's not entirely the same, but it's very similar. Uh, I later read that the writer did not add any, any new lines, did not change the order of things. He simply cut to save time. So what's on the screen in the movie is pretty close to what we have on the page. OK, we have a little time left, so let me guide you through the beginning of Act 2. This is on page 1268. Act 2, scene 1. Enter Banquo with Fleance with a torch before him. Fleance is, of course, Banquo's son. Banquo, how goes the night, boy? Fleance. The moon is down. I have not heard the clock. So this is kind of scary. It's the middle of the night. They have to hold their own light. And Fleon says there's no moon. And I haven't heard the clock, so I don't know what time it is. So it's basically in the middle of the night. It could be any time. This is when evil stuff happens. Banco, and she goes down at 12, so it must be after 12. The moon goes down at midnight. It must be deep into the early morning. Fleance, I take it is later, sir. So in my view, it is later than midnight. Banco, hold, which means stop. Take my sword. He gives him his sword. There's husbandry in heaven. So there, heaven has some kind of skill to take care of us. There's something going on in heaven. Their candles are all out, so we can't even see the stars. Take thee that too. He gives him his belt and dagger. A dagger is a short uh, sword, bezel. A heavy summons lies like lead upon me, and yet I would not sleep. So a heavy summons just means he feels sleepy. His, his bed is summoning him, is calling out to him, and yet I would not sleep. Merciful powers, so again praying to the supernatural, restrain in me the cursed thoughts that nature gives way to in repose. Prevent me from thinking those evil thoughts that come to me when I'm resting. And these are probably related to the witches telling him that his children will become kings. This is also very interesting in a political sense because James the first is Scottish. Right, he was James the sixth of Scotland and then also became James the first of England. So he's Scottish. This play takes place in Scotland. And so, in fact, Banquo supposedly is King James's ancestor. 
it's a story about King James's family. And so you'll notice that in the play, Banquo is one of the few truly good people. Right, so Shakespeare is also trying to flatter the king. He's saying your family are perfect. Uh, and there's another historical aspect too. Like the night is so dark, they can't see the moon. They can't see the stars. What in the world? And this is because actually in Elizabethan and Jacobian England, especially around London, the big cities, there was so much nightlife. There's so much activity at night and they had to burn so much coal. That in fact, they had a very bad air pollution problem. And many times even during the day, it could be hard to see the sky. So this would be an experience that many Londoners would have at night. They can't see the sky. They can't see the stars. But here the play is making it into something supernatural and spooky. OK, enter Macbeth and a servant with a torch. And this is still Banquo talking. Banquo says, give me my sword. Who's there? He takes his sword. Macbeth, a friend. Banquo, what, sir? Not yet at rest? The king's abed, so the king has gone to sleep. He has been in unusual pleasure, so he's been unusually happy. And sent forth great largesse to your offices. So this could mean he paid many compliments to you as host. It could mean he gave you many gifts because you're such a good host. Largesse means wealth, Taifu. This diamond he greets your wife with all. So he gave your wife a diamond. By the name of most kind hostess and shut up in measureless content. Uh, so he's so happy that he can't even speak. And so Banquo gives a diamond. Macbeth, being unprepared, our will became the servant to defect, which else should free have wrought. So he, here he's also being polite. I did not prepare well enough, so I didn't do a good job as host. Otherwise, I would have done better. Banquo, all's well. It's fine. And then a line break. So he's moving on to the next topic. I dreamt last night of the three weird sisters. To you, they have showed some truth. And Macbeth says, I think not of them. <laughs> As if. Macbeth says, I don't think of the witches. But we know that he thinks about them all the time. Yet, when we can entreat an hour to serve, we would spend it in some words upon that business if you would grant the time. So if you have an hour to spare, we should talk about what they said. Banquo, at your kindest leisure, so whenever you want. Remember, Macbeth is higher ranking than Banquo, so Banquo calls him sir. Macbeth, if you shall cleave to my consent when tis, it shall make honor for you. Cleave to means attach to, cling to, grab onto. So if I tell you when we should talk about this and you agree, it shall make honor for you. It would be a very honorable thing for you. Banquo, so I lose none in seeking to augment it, but still keep my bosom franchised and allegiance clear, I shall be counseled. Here the word so means so long as, or, or as long as. As long as I don't lose any honor when following you, augment means increase. Macbeth just said, if you follow me, I, you will have more honor. So he says, as long as I don't lose honor in trying to gain honor by following you, but instead can still keep my bosom, which means chest, which means my heart, franchised, which means free, and allegiance clear, so I know who I'm loyal to, I shall be counseled, which means I will follow you. 
So if we translate this, it means as long as we don't do anything wrong and I still have my own free will and everything's fine, then I will follow you. Macbeth, good repose the while, so have a good rest before then. Banquo, thanks, sir, the like to you, the same to you. Exit Banquo with Fleance. So now we only have Macbeth and the servant on stage. Go bid thy mistress. So go tell Lady Macbeth. When my drink is ready, she strike upon the bell. So when my drink is ready, she'll ring the bell. Tell her to do that. Get thee to bed and then they go to sleep. We know from their previous plan that the bell is actually not for the drink. It's for the assassination. And the servant goes. And then we get another famous soliloquy from Macbeth. This play is full of famous soliloquies and famous lines, probably because it's the play that most people read first. It's one of the more interesting plays, and it's also shorter. You'll probably remember this from the movie. Is this a dagger which I see before me? The handle toward my hand? Come, let me clutch thee, let me grab you. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. Usually in a performance at this point, the actor would act like he's grabbing the dagger. And he says, I, I can't grab you, and yet I still see you. Art thou not fatal vision, sensible to feeling as to sight? So he calls it a fatal vision. Fatal here means related to fate. So I can see you, but I can't feel you. Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation proceeding from the heat oppressed brain? So are you real or am I going crazy? This is also a common phrase, a dagger of the mind, which means a symbol of ambition. Macbeth wants to be king so badly that he hallucinates a dagger in front of him. I see thee yet in form as palpable as this which now I draw. So even as I'm talking, I can still see you. You look as physical as this dagger, and he pulls out his own dagger. Thou marshalst me the way that I was going. To marshal somebody means to call somebody, to lead somebody. So you're leading me the way that I was already going. And such an instrument I was to use, and you are the tool that I was going to use anyway. Mine eyes are made the fools of the other senses. Or else worth all the rest. So it's like my eyes are worthless compared to all of my other senses because it sees something I can't touch. Or else it is as equally worthless as all the rest of my senses. So either my eyes are cheating me or all of my senses are, are crazy. I see thee still, so I'm talking and yet I can still see you. And on thy blade and dudgeon gouts of blood, which was not so before. And I suddenly noticed that there's blood on you. There's no such thing. It is the bloody business which informs thus to mine eyes. So you're not real. It's because I'm thinking about killing Duncan that I can see you. Now or the one half world, nature seems dead. So everybody is asleep. Uh, one half world is like on this side of the world. Nature seems dead and wicked dreams abuse the curtains sleep. So in this part of the world, everybody is dead asleep and dreaming terrible dreams. Witchcraft celebrates Pale Hecate's offerings. Hecate is the goddess of witchcraft. And withered murder, alarmed by his sentinel, the wolf. Alarmed means alerted. By his sentinel, sentinel is a watchman. The wolf, 
whose howls his watch, thus with his stealthy pace, with Tarquin's ravishing strides, towards his design moves like a ghost. So he, at this point, he probably hears the howl of a wolf, and he thinks, oh, this is the sign of evil. This is a sign of murder. And when he says murder moves toward his design like a ghost, he's talking about himself. He is moving to kill Duncan. Thou sure, which means certain, and firm set earth, the ground. Hear not my steps, which way they walk, for fear thy very stones prate of my whereabout. Prate means talk. Whereabout means location. We still use this word in modern English, but we add an S. We say whereabouts. And take the present horror from the time which now suits with it. So don't let anybody know where I'm going. Don't let the horror of killing the king be here in this moment. Take it away. While as I threat, he lives. So as long as the king is alive, I am threatened. Sorry, sorry. Uh, as long as I only threaten to kill him, he is still alive. Words to the heat of deeds, too cold breath gives. So compared to the heat of action, of deeds, words are too cold. A bell rings. So this is Lady Macbeth telling him, OK, you can go kill the king now. I go and it is done. If I go, it will be done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell. A knell is a, is a death knell. It's when somebody dies and the church rings the bell to tell people this person has died. For it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. Bum, bum, bum. You'll notice that in many cases, uh, the last two lines of a scene or an act will rhyme. And this tells the actors, this is the end of the scene, change actors on stage. It helps them remember what happens next. OK, so before next week, please finish up to the end of Act 3. See you next week.